All night long they hurl the flames, mast on the pyre, blast on screaming blast, and all night long the swift Achilles, lifting a two-handed cup, dipped wine from a golden bow and poured it down on the ground and drenched the earth, calling out to the ghost of stricken, gaunt Patroclus. And then an amazing symbol. As a father weeps when he burns his son's bones, dead on his wedding day, we're going to think about Priam, obviously. And his death has plunged his parents in despair. So Achilles wept as he burned his dear friend's bones, dragging himself around the pyre, choking with sobs. And then over to page 278, I'm sorry, over to line 278, he says, after the burning is done, let us place Patroclus' bones in a golden urn, sealed tight and dry with a double fat, a fold of fat, till I myself lie hid in the strong house of death. For his borrow... Build him nothing large, I ask you. So in other words, we think back, we, we think to uh, the, uh, Beowulf and his, and his request for Beowulf's barrel. Here it's, build him a barrel, but not real large, I ask you. Something right for the moment. And then later, Achaeans can work to make it broad and lofty. All who survive me here, alive in the beach ships when I'm gone. So in other words, um, Achilles knows I'm going to die soon. Let's put my, my um, ashes in to commingle along, right? Um, and so um, then we will have the funeral games. Now let's pause for a moment and ask about these funeral games, all right? What's going on here? Well, scholars have pointed out several things. Let's put them in our notes. Here we could have the notion of distraction from grieving, right? Um, we can think about this, for example, in any kind of national tra tragedy. Think about the 9-11 tragedy in America and the ball games that were played immediately afterwards and how important they were. I'm especially thinking, of course, of that famous New York game, the Mets game. Um, right afterwards um, uh, against uh, the Braves, right? That was, a, that was a compelling game. For those of us who, who, who survived that, okay? You can Google that, uh, um, obviously, if you were too young to be a part of it. Um, what's up with the games? Well, they could be a celebration for the living. A lot of scholars have pointed that out. In other words, a tribute to Patroclus, who is now dead, to show the, uh, the, the, the strength. Remember, we, we sometimes forget that while the Iliad is about to end, these, these warriors, these Myrmidons and the rest of them, they, they still have to fight. Odysseus doesn't get to go, oh, okay, so Patroclus died and we buried him and now we all get to go home. No, no, no. Troy still hasn't fallen, right? So we still got to have all of that. So maybe it's a little bit of that celebration of the living. Um, it may be a way, I think this is a really good argument, a way for the poet to give some relief, kind of like the silliness of Book 21 got you ready for the uh, work. Of course, when we're studying our Shakespeare, we call this comic relief, don't we? It could be a way, I think, and I think this is one of the better, better answers as to what's going on in the games, because it shows two things. It shows the Greeks as incredibly competitive. When they're not fighting and killing Trojans, they're still competing. But it's also a way to show how healthy conflict resolution looks and how it works. We're going to see that here. The Greeks, as I said, they love this competition, so sport becomes a healthy way to compete instead of real fighting and killing. Okay. So Achilles will begin the games um, at lines 295, right? Um, Achilles held the armies on the spot. He had them sit in a great growing circle now for funeral games and brought from his ships the trophies for the contest, cauldrons and tripods, stallions, mules and cattle with massive heads, women sashed and lovely and gleaming gray iron. So in other words, it's, it's an amazing thing, the poet. He just starts listing all the different potential trophies and prizes that winners are going to get for these competitions and oh yeah the women are were a part of it as well amazing i mean it does take us back to the opening of the poem and the fact that these men grown men are fighting over which one gets to sleep and rape uh sleep with and rape uh Brisaius, although uh agamemnon promises he never touched her right um and, and where is where where is this woman no, nowhere to be found the only time she comments in the entire poem is when she sees the body of Patroclus, uh, the corpse of Patroclus, and she laments it because Patroclus said he would find some way for Achilles to marry her, the, the Achilles who had killed her father, her mother, and all, and all of her brothers and taken down her city. It's an, amazing, it's an amazing insight into the ways in which ancient Greeks saw women. Of course, our study of the patriarchy will come uh, to its fruition when we meet Chaucer's wife of Bath, right? We'll, we'll have to wait on that one. First he says, first we're told, the fastest charioteers he set out glittering prizes. A woman to lead away, flawless skilled in crafts, and a two-year tripod 22 measures deep. All that for the first prize. 
Then for the runner-up, he brought forth a mare, unbroken six months old, with a mule fowl in her womb. For the third, he produced a fine four-measured cauldron, never scorched by flames, and on and on it goes. And he rises, and he goes, um, let the games begin, right? Okay, it's the, it's the same lines of the opening of the, of, of the uh, Olympics today, right? So now we've got event number one, the famed chariot race. And for those of you who know anything about the, uh, the great film of Charlton Heston, Ben-Hur, uh, it all comes from this scene, right? Uh, or any film where we have races, whether it be vehicles or it be animals or whatever, okay? We got what happens before the race. Nestor's going to give his boys some advice. He says, it's, he says, so plan your attack, my son. Muster all your skills or watch the prize slip by. It's skill, not brawn, that makes the finest woodsman. By skill, too, the captain holds his ship in course, scudding the wine dark sea, through rocked, though rocked by gales. By skill alone, charioteer outraces charioteer. So in other words, they're going to go down on the plane, they're going to go around this thing and come back. And he says, skill. Skill is the key, right? So listen, and he gives them kind of the insight as to how to do this. It's not that he's telling them how to cheat, but he will say, keep your head. At line um, 390, he says, keep your head, my boy. Be on the lookout. Trail the field out, but pass them all at the post. No one can catch you then or overtake you with a surge. Not if a man behind you were driving huge Aaron. Adresis is lightning stallion side by the gods. Um, in other words... I'm giving you a way to win. Nestor sat down. He'd shown his son the ropes, the last word in the master horseman's skills. Okay, so in other words, he gives his advice, right? Um, we're, we're then told that during the, the, uh, the chariot race, Diomedes will have his exchange, um, um, his back and forth with Eumelius at line 430. Um, all of a sudden, Apollo... Diomedes is in the lead. He will get the, um, all of a sudden, Diomedes had knocked, uh, uh, Apollo knocks out the shining whip from Diomedes' fist. Tears of rage came streaming down his cheeks as he watched Eumelius' mares pulling further ahead and his team losing pace. No whip to lash them on, but we're told, Athena, missing nothing of, of Apollo's foul play that robbed uh, uh, Diomedes, sped to the galling captain, handed him back his whip, primed his team with power, and flying after it, he meant to his son in full immortal fury. The goddess smashed his yoke. So, in other words, poor Eumaeus will have his... Um, will have his, his um, chariot jacked up by Athena, right? His mares bolted apart, careening off the track, his, plow, his, his bull plowed the ground, and Emilius um, hurled from the chariot, tumbling over the wheel. The skin was ripped from his elbows, mouth, and nostrils. His forehead battered in, scraped raw at the brows. In other words, he almost dies. Tears filled his eyes, his booming voice choked. But veering round the wreck, Diomedes goes around him, steered his racer, shooting far ahead of the rest, leaving them in the dust. Okay. The next, um, during the race, we have Antilochus versus Menelaus at line 470. Then, all of a sudden, um, Menelaus, we're told, is heading, but they're coming to the turn, but no room for the two side by side abreast. But Antilochus swerved to pass him, lashing his horses off the track, then swerving into him, neck and neck, in other words, he cuts him off. And Atreides, frightened, yelled out at Antilochus, Antilochus, you drive like a maniac, if you've heard that line, it comes from here. Hold your horses, the track's too narrow here, it widens soon for passing. Watch out, you'll crash your chariot, wreck us both. And then a little bit later, at the end of this, at line 490, he says, Antilochus, no one alive more treacherous than you, away with you, madman. And then he says it, damn you, how wrong you were when we said, how wrong we were when we said, we had that you had good sense. You'll never take the prize unless you take the oath. In other words, you're cheating. How dare you cut me off, if you will. We have the whirlwind finish, uh, finally, um, at line 555 or so. In the same breath, Diomedes came storming toward them closer, and then the word look, the poet is trying to make you get a sense of how this whole project is, is happening very quickly. Closing lashing his team non-stop full shoulder strokes, making them kick as high as they hurtled toward the goal. Constant sprays of dust kept pelting back on the driver, the chariot sheathed in gold and ten careening on in the plunging stallion's wake, its spinning rims hardly leaving a rut behind in the, thin, in the thin dust as the team thundered on in a whirlwind finish. This, uh, all lovers of sport love this, love this, uh, this book because the chariot race 
I mean, it, it embodies that notion of why we love sport, right? Who's going to win? It's all exciting. By the way, there's a fight that almost breaks out between two of them and guys wanting to, guys wanting to uh, bet and Achilles having to tell them to sit down and shut up and the like. So we have what happens before the race, during the race, and now after the race. When after the race we're told that uh, Emilius came in last, right, and Achilles was filled with pity, we're told at line uh, 555 or so. He rises and they're missing. He says, the best man drives his purebred team home last? Come, let's give him a prize. It's only right. But second prize, of course, right? D uh, Diomedes gets to keep his first prize. And he said that, and all the armies were told to send. At line 600, though, when Achilles was just about to give the second place prize, it's Antilochus, the son of Nestor, who, by the way, came in second, who says, um, yeah, no, I'll be furious, he says, Achilles, if you carry out that plan. Notice, We've got a war of words that are about to happen. Do you really mean to strip me of my prize? So concerned that his team and car were wrecked? And the fellow too, for all his racing skills? Why, he should have prayed to the deathless gods? Then he would never have finished last of all. You pity the man? You're fond of him, are you? You have hordes of gold in your tents, bronze sheep, serving girls by the score, and purebred racers too. Pick some bigger trophy out of the whole lot. Hand it to that man, but do it later or now at once, and win your troops applause, I won't give up my prize, the mayor. The one who wants her, step this way and try. He'll have to fight me for her with his fists. In other words, Antilochus, the young man, says, yeah, no, you ain't giving my prize away. We're told then at line 618, Antilochus flared up, and the swift runner Achilles smiled, delighting in Antilochus. He liked the man immensely. He answered him warmly, winged words, Antilochus, you want me to fetch an extra gift from my tents, a consolation prize from Emilus. I'm glad to do it. I'll give them the breastplate I took, blah, 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 blah. But now Menelaus, we're told, rises up at line 430, and he goes, hang on, his heart smoldering, still holding a stubborn grudge against Antilochus. A crier put a staff in his hands and called for silence, and with all his royal might, Menelaus thunders, Antilochus, you used to have good sense. Now see what you've done, disgraced my horsemanship. You have fouled my horses, cutting before me, you with your far slower team. And then he explains, as kid cheated, and that's how he won. Wait, he says, Menelaus says, wait, I'll settle things myself, he says. I have no fear that any Achaean will accuse me. I'll be fair. Come over here, Antilochus, royal prince. This is the old custom. Come, stand in front of your team and chariot, grasp the coiling whip, that lash them home. Lay your hand on the horse's manes and swear by the mighty God who grips and shakes the earth beside me. You never block my chariot, not by deliberate foul. In other words, say out loud and swear in front of the gods you didn't cheat. Antilochus, we said, came to his senses. He backed off quickly. So notice, we got the potential here for a major fight, just like we had the potential for a major fight at the very beginning of this poem when Agamemnon and Achilles were going at it. Antilochus says, No more, please. I'm much younger than you are, Lord Menelaus. You're my senior, you the greater man. Well, you know how the whims of youth break all the rules. Our wits quicker than wind, our judgment just as flighty. Bear with me now. I'll give you this mare I won. In other words, he's ready to give up his prize of my own accord. And any finer trophy you'd ask from my own stores, I'll volunteer at once. Gladly, Menelaus, my royal king, anything but fall from your favor all the days to come and swear a false oath in the eyes of every god. In other words, he says it. I'm not willing to, to go there, right? With that, we're told, <coughs> excuse me, the son of Magnaminius, old Nestor, uh, uh, Antilochus, led the mare and turned her over to Menelaus's hands. And Menelaus's heart melted now, like the dew that wets the corn when the fresh stalks rise up and the ripe fields ripple. So the heart in your chest, back to that construction again, was melted now, Menelaus, and you gave your friend an answer, winged words, Antilochus. Now it's my turn to yield to you, all my mounting anger. You, who were never wild or reckless in the past, it's only youth that got the better of your discretion, just this once. But the next time, be more careful. Try to refrain from cheating your superiors. No other Achaean could have brought me round so soon, but seeing that you've suffered much and labored long, your noble father, your brother too, all for my sake, Menelaus reminding them that they're all there fighting because he lost his wife, Helen, right? I'll yield to your appeal. I'll even give you the mare, though she is mine, 
So our people here will know the heart inside me is never rigid, unrelenting. This is the way we solve conflict. Do you get me? Do you understand what's going on? So in other words, this is no throwaway book or throwaway scene. This is important. This is how you resolve stuff. Or Arminialize gets mad, and then he goes, okay, 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 I'm sorry. Right? He hands it back. Right? Bearing it now, we're told, Achilles, through the crowd, comes to Nestor, standing close to him and urging him. Nestor, the father of Antilochus, says, Here, old friend, a trophy for you too. Lay it away as a treasure. Let it remind you of the burial of Patroclus. Never again will you see him among the Argives. I give you this prize, a gift for giving sake. For now, you will never fight with fists or wrestle. In other words, you're too old to, to participate in the games. Or enter the spear throw or race on spreading feet. The burdens of old age of all, 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 burdens of old age already weigh you down. I mean, we think about this in any kind of awards type of situation, whether it be sports or arts or whatever. Oftentimes, the older who are no longer really capable of competing, but they're still given some kind of honorary award. Why? Memory. And Achilles placed the trophy in Esther's hands and thrilled, he thrilled to have it and spoke out winking words, true, true, my son of, the, of, of it. Right on the mark, he says, my legs no longer firm, my friend, dead on my feet. Every time Nestor talks, he's like, it's about how old he is. Nor do my arms go shooting from my shoulders, the stunning punch, the left and right are gone. Oh, he says it, like he always does. Make me young again and the strength inside me, steady as a rock. He finishes this speech and says, that's the man I was long ago, but now's the time for the younger men to lock in rough encounters, time for me to yield to the pains of old age. There was a day I shone among the champions. Well, he says, you must get on with your friend's burial now, the games must go on, but I accept this gladly, line 720. You never, he says about Achilles, you never forget my friendship, right? Never miss a chance to pay me honor. Think about the ways in which this is, again, a message. Young, showing honor to the old. Well, the events to follow now quickly, uh, event number two, we've got the boxing um, that happens, and uh, we're told both champions at line uh, 763 uh, or so, both champions belted tight, stepped into the ring, squared off, terrific grinding of jaws as they slug it out, smashing roundhouse hook to the head, a knockout blow, and so badly that, um, uh, um, that his feet are dragging, his head is lolling, and spitting clots of blood are coming out. In other words, this is a serious boxing match, right? Event number three is the wrestling event, um, a grueling wrestling match for a winner at line 780, a large tripod made to stride a fire, and for the loser, Achilles led a woman through their midst, worth four, they thought, and skilled in many crafts, okay? Um, and then you have Ajax and Odysseus who are going to fight. They get to a standstill, so much so that in fact the warriors are getting kind of bored by it all. Odysseus finally will win, but Achilles will stop them at line seven, um, uh, or at line eight, um, eight, eighteen or so. He says, no more struggling, don't kill yourselves in sport. Victory goes to both. Share the prizes. Well, the prizes, we already have heard what they are, a woman and, and a tripod, right? Off you go, so the rest of the men can have a crack at contests, right? Okay. Um, in other words, a woman and a tripod is considered of equal value here and can be shared. Go figure. Event four, you have the foot race. Um, they're coming around the home stretch at line, uh, line 853. I wish I could read all of this to you. Odysseus prays to the goddess, help me. Um, hurry, urge me on. Odysseus prays. Athena helps him. And Athena trips up um, Ajax, right? Right where the dung lay slick from bellowing cattle. The swift runner Achilles slew in Patroclus' honor. Dung stuffed his mouth, his nostrils dripped muck. In other words, he falls right into the poop, and he cries, Foul by heaven, the goddess fouled my finish. Always beside Odysseus, um, Aix says, just like the man's mother rushing to put his rivals in the dust. We, we'll come back to the lines like this when we study the Odyssey. Um, book five, we've got the duel for Sarpedon's arms. Achilles will name Diomedes the winner. Event six, we've got the Iron Toss, and Polycetus uh, will win that one. Book se uh, event seven, we have the Archery um, Contest, where Teucer will hit the rope, and we're told that uh, Miranus is able to um, shoot a dove flying out of the air, and we're told at line um, 978, the armies looked on wonderstruck and marveled. Uh, Miranes uh, carried off the double um, axes, all ten, and Teucer took the singles back to his hollow ships. To finish, finally, Achilles produced a spear that trailed its long shadow, cauldron too, untouched by fire. 
chased with flowers, were the ox, and set them down in the rain. And now the spear throwers, the final event number eight, rose up to compete. Atrides Agamemnon, lord of the far-flung kingdoms, flanked by Idomenus' rough and ready aid Meronis. But the swift runner Achilles interceded at once, Atrides Agamemnon, well we know how far you excel us all. No one can match your strength in throwing spears. You are the best by far. Take first prize and return to your hollow ships while we award this spear to the fighter Moronis. That, if that would please your heart. That's what I propose. In other words, uh, Agamemnon, you don't even have to throw. We know you're better at this than all of us. Let me name you first prize. And Agamemnon, the Lord of Men, could not resist. Achilles gave the bronze shod spear to Moronis, and the winning hero, Atreides of uh, Agamemnon, gave his own prize to his herald, the king's burnished trophy. So in other words, notice how at the end of this book, we have a willingness to have healthy competition, right? Instead of going at each other and creating all kinds of conflict, linguistically or, or physically. All right, let's jump quickly to levels two and three. At 2A, I already mentioned it, healthy competition, better, way better than killing in battles, right? Again, sports can be a good distraction during times of grieving. We, we think, as we've already said, about the situation in our own country in 9-11, right? Finally, this one. How about this one? Sometimes you need an umpire. The irony, of course, will be that the umpire is Achilles. You need an umpire to resolve conflict. Notice in the opening of our poem, Nestor tried to do that, but it didn't work out. Here, Achilles can do that as umpire. At 2B, the symbol, well, Patroclus's ghost is obviously a symbol of Achilles' imminent death that's coming. The urn, the ashes are going to be put into, powerful symbol as well that's going to hold both of the ashes together. And we'll think later um, when we study Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn, the significance of the urn. The irony, as we've said, of course, is that Achilles now becomes the umpire. He tells the others to show restraint. And, of course, he even defers to Agamemnon at the end of the book, which is kind of a class act, right? At 3A, well, what are the texts? I mentioned Ben-Hur and the famous chariot scene.